Hi, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you can join us today uh, for today's topic. Um, my name is Lauren West and I'm with CPG Beauty and Beyond, um, which is an LA-based consulting agency supporting entrepreneurs and established beauty brands to launch their products faster, better, and more efficiently. And today's topic, we're going to talk all about innovation and uh, mitigating risk. Um, two of those areas, some top strategies, your your company can use or as you're starting off building a new brand um, that you can keep in mind um, as you go to launch your new product so let me just pop up my presentation here shortly um, so you can see my screen one second so today's topic is about strategies that you guys can utilize um, to create better innovation and mitigate risk on your projects with specifically keeping in mind to beauty brands but this could also be applied elsewhere um, if you're a product-based company and the reason why these two things are so important as it's it's very it's really key as a company to really stay on top of how are you going to innovate whether that will be through some new technology um, in your product or bringing um, something a new product first to market being first to market as well as just expanding as a company and bringing more innovation into your process flow and how you do things and alongside innovation the other element is to kind of mitigate risk that you're taking on whether that might be financial liability as you launch a new product or also just the operational risks as you move forward launching um, a new brand there's always things that are pretty typical that that companies encounter and should always try to take in mind to kind of um, recap what risks you have and how to mitigate those from the start okay so to start off um, one of the first strategies I really recommend um, when I go into different clientele and once I've been able to really establish and understand a little better how, um, how companies function is to really, hold on a second, my slide just moved, is to implement what's called a project steering committee. And what this really allows um, teams to do, except, especially from an executive management level and department um, leadership level, is to really get a big picture scope of what are we working on as a company? Um, what is coming up next? What are some key issues, some critical concerns with our current projects, as well as for new product concepts that are coming up in the pipeline? What are some key dates we need to hit? What are some key liabilities we have issues with? And really allows a platform of open communication. Um, that's one of the things that will tie back into on strategy number five along with teams and communication um, but really having a committee a designated um, committee or even a meeting whatever it might be for your company as you see fit um, is to really implement a platform for that that communication project communication to be um, to basically solidify it as important but nonetheless allow it as ongoing in your in your company and what this allows team members to do especially at lower level say within an operational team or a product development team creative team um, or packaging for example is to really highlight um, so pro some professionals that may be working for you as well as from a marketing team to have that opportunity to present ideas and share um, share about their projects to an executive team so sometimes there isn't always that top-down communication so this not only serves as an option of of servicing your project management needs as a company overall from a big picture but also allows team members to shine in a different way and present some new product ideas and marketing strategies directly to upper management within companies so that there is that exchange of ideas and interaction and highlighting team members as they grow within your organization. So I think that's also a great opportunity to, you know, highlight and appreciate the team members that you do have. And also as a side note, you know, looking to retain top talent, presenting new opportunities for people at your, at your company. Um, from an innovation standpoint, as well as mitigating risk, usually this type of committee would have a variety of product launches that are reviewed for upcoming potential launches in the pipeline and so in a launch overview you know essentially you know you'd be outlining you know key timing key liabilities that are needed 
looking at no-go dates of when does a project need to be approved by in order to actually hit that launch date. So for example, there could be a lot of initial, initial concept design and formulation design, say four to six months initially. And then as it gets closer to understanding when your need to order by dates are for different components and packaging, whether it's primary packaging with, with bottles in jars or tubes, as well as secondary, um, that way you know key dates. And the other element, which is strategy number two, which will tie in, uh, is, the, is the project P&L statement. But that also can be presented and reviewed in a steering committee or secondary. Um, it can be you know, reviewed just you know, one on one with upper management or whoever is designated to get those P&L approvals. So something I find that not a lot of companies have, um, especially as they start out, but even more so even as they're established, even if they're million dollar brands, is they don't always have the, um, what I call a profit and loss statement for their projects in place for an overall review and approval. So sometimes companies are really looking at small pieces of the puzzle as they go, as they're building projects. And what I find is without having all of kind of a screenshot initially of having all this information reviewed. Sometimes things get miss, missed through the cracks or not everybody is aware of really what the margin's at or what's needed to be able to actually make um, what kind of profit you wanna make on, on a particular product launch. And so having all this information together in one spot for like a final overall approval is really needed. And sometimes I think the challenge is companies face is really kind of getting all this information together rather quickly, but being able to build in better project planning initially is really strategic and key to setting up to getting a profit and loss statement established. Um, and really what that entails is cost of goods. So understanding the desired packaging options you might have and running down different scenarios with your teams or whether if you're just starting out and you're reaching out to a cosmetic manufacturer, really looking at all the different avenues of how could you produce this product and what is your end target if you want it to be a prestige, you know, beauty, beauty brand product or a mass market brand um, level. Those both have two different uh, price point ranges typically and looking at um, where your cost of goods needs to be in order to have it be profitable for your company to consider. The other thing is to really have your, you know, initial launch forecast and, and especially a six month projected sales plan. So that way your operations team has a flow and a better understanding of what's going to be coming next, what are the component needs in the next three to six months after, after you initially launch it. Um, and also getting, as I mentioned before, getting really clear on desired packaging options. And that can come both in play from a PD department that your company may have, as well as as a creative department and bringing in that branding element too as well. So from you know product from the design itself to color, to how exactly do you wanna communicate your message about this product? How do you want consumers to feel? So all this kind of ties into all those desired packaging options and really looking at um, what makes sense for your company as a business. Um, one thing I didn't note here is I'll be beefing up these slides before I um, upload this to the resource area for everybody later on to use, is to really also consider you know, your project volume overall. A lot of companies that are established, especially in the beauty business, you know, you're running first to market and you're trying to get launched as quickly as possible, is what is the true capacity of your teams? Um, whether that's you know, your company is set up to produce everything in-house um, or you're relying on outside vendors to do all that production. So really looking at, you know, what can your teams really take on in capacity wise over a given month. So the other thing I also like to um, do for clientele or I recommend on setting up is some type of basically launch calendar and timing so that it's understood from an executive level how many projects are currently being, you know, currently being worked on, what's coming next. So you can plan ahead and understand, hey, quarter four of next year is gonna be really, really busy. Maybe we wanna, you know, give our teams, you know, a break in Q3, or we might wanna revisit and then remap out to make it a little bit better flow. So one quarter isn't too heavy over another. 
So there's always multiple reasons of doing that as well. But keeping that in mind, even in a profit loss statement of understanding launch timing and when, um, when best to get that out for everybody involved is, is really key as well. So from a strategy standpoint, um, for our strategy number three is really looking at concept, product concept documentation and initial market research. So a lot of, a lot of times, especially at smaller beauty brands um, that may not have as formal of structure and may not really be designed with a corporate background as some other beauty brands such as, you know, Murad and Cody and some other other organizations have a lot more formal structure to them is really having enough documentation to not only understand what exactly am I working on, but to retain a history of what your teams have been have been working on towards innovation. So that way, say if you have, if you're doing project planning, product planning for your next year, and you want to map out what exactly do you want to launch for 2019 or 2020, you can have a resource of here's some initial concept requests that we worked on. Say we didn't move them to the go stage and approve them yet, but we still have all this information of here's what we can go back and rely on. Here's some initial research that we did before. Um, so what that entails is usually I'll set up two separate forms is an initial concept request form, um, usually going from a marketing sales department or a visionary department that works with your executive team or say an entrepreneurial type company is basically a concept request form that goes into a PD um, department or you can send this out to, to a contract manufacturer to do some initial initial research for you as well on this. And then that form essentially will have all the key, key initial information to do some initial research. And usually that will include a few product benchmarks um, the marketing team is looking to identify with, whether that might be a competitor beauty brands product that you want to emulate or have be somewhat similar to, or for example, there might be a new ingredient um, that is very popular or something that hasn't really been tried in a beauty product before and might be interesting. So there might be some additional research that is desired to be done to see if that's even feasible or, or wanted. And not only looking at product benchmarks from like a packaging standpoint, but also, as I mentioned with ingredients, looking at more from the actual product itself and what's the story behind it that way. So from doing this documentation, it just gives you additional research. So when your innovation team and when your marketing team is trying to think, oh, you know, what are we going to create next? Or say, for example, if you have your own research and development team for larger companies, they usually, they might have an R&D department um, specifically set up for this, is to really look at new innovation. So that way, just keeping history of what have you looked at before so you can revisit it and go back to it and does it make sense for me now the other thing is you know people also look at um, innovation in terms of you know what kind of skin issue do they want to accomplish do you want to get rid of redness do you want to help with hydration um, do you want to help with you know clarity of the skin and evening balancing out skin tone so just looking at the benefit of the product as well so that also really comes into key information as well providing on these types of documentation um, but you know what you don't document you can't track and so I really recommend to you know take a look at your documentation in general as what are you you know what keeping track of what exactly are you analyzing to establish as innovation for your company and then having that market research of understanding what other companies may already be working on something similar to this maybe a company might have teased you know in their consumer marketing that they might be launching something soon so just kind of understanding what other key um, key competitors might you be looking at competing with for your own launch coming up and understanding what's you know what you might be what you might be competing with um, so that's, that's really key is to really do enough initial market research and really relying on there's, you know, different companies out there that will cater to offer um, research as well. I haven't found a whole lot of them to be, you know, one super, you know, concrete and great that I would recommend over another, but there, that's other, always another 
excuse me, another source out there. And in part of this research also leads to my strategy number four, which is really staying in connection um, with your industry and vendors. So really leveraging the relationships you do have in the industry, whatever that might be. Um, and for those companies that really utilize outside manufacturing, really relying on them to tell you kind of what's coming next and and what's a really innovative um, thing to bring to market. So a lot of, you know, a lot of manufacturers, you know, they'll work on custom formulas for you based on what you kind of desire to do, but they also have a pulse on, on the beauty um, industry as well, if that's what they cater to. Um, they'll have some directional um, expertise some directional expertise to rely on as well. So besides just keeping that kind of relationship going with your current and new suppliers, is also utilizing a lot of different resources that are out there. And that can be both in person and online um, and in print. So for example, um, beauty trade shows are really great to you know meet new people, create new connections, see what other brands are doing, see what's out there and what's coming next. I just recently went up to Las Vegas and attended um, the Cosmoprof North America show, which happens in July in Vegas every year. And I think it's cosmoprofnorthamerica.com. I'll add that to the slide as well as reference. Um, that, that show basically encompasses, you know, everything beauty from like a professional side as well as a, as a contract manufacturer side. Um, and brand side as well. So there's a lot of lots of things to see, uh, especially if you're, you know, an entrepreneur considering um, getting into the beauty business. It would be a great thing to try to connect with and go. And if Vegas is a little too far for you, they have the Ice Show, which is typically locate um, typically uh, hosted in Long Beach every January at the end of January. I believe it stands for the International Salon um, Exhibition forget what the second S stands for, but that also really caters um, to brands. Um, it's a smaller show than Cosmoprof, but it does do a lot of product cash and carry, so you can get better deals there and actually carry out product from that show. And then they have a couple consumer-based shows that might be interested to see you know, how these other outfits are, are um, serving consumers so you can start to see some additional trends that are coming out. So they have BeautyCon that was just recently hosted in LA um, in the middle of July. I believe they hold it every July. They also have a show in New York as well. So I believe that particular um, show is only held in the two locations, but they're, you know, heavy markets for beauty, both LA and New York, but it's consumer based as well. So you can see kind of what's actually being marketed um, at the very end to consumers. And then Sephora has a, a new show um, that I might be attending myself called Sephora. Um, and I believe it's going to be a consumer based show as well as providing a marketplace for various different beauty entrepreneurs to speak at. So it'll be interesting to see um, what that is all about. And that's scheduled for fall um, in October later this year. Another resource I know a lot of companies, you know, tend to utilize, it's great to connect with is, you know, what's, what's currently kind of coming out in magazines and beauty blogs as trends. Um, one of which I follow the cos the global cosmetic magazine. They do a digital, a free digital online subscription and newsletter, which really comes out with great things coming up. Um, just having a pulse on beauty of what might be happening from larger conglomerates to what kind of trends are coming up. Uh, what beauty companies might have been acquired recently, as, as well as um, products, products and packaging, um, any kind of new innovation with that. There's always a lot of articles and resources there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, is really trying to keep with just um, really keeping a pulse on the relationships you do have with your current suppliers as well as when you get new suppliers and really nourishing those relationships. So setting up regular meetings and, and really kind of doing typical audits. And as you obtain a new supplier, what exactly do you expect of them? So having that kind of established and set up with how do you want that relationship to be like can also really nourish your brand and your business back when you are looking to rely on them to you know mitigate risk and go back in and you know, be able to shrink timelines for you and you turn things around quicker is to, you know, the relationships with vendors are two-way streets. So 
you know, is there an opportunity for you to refer them to somebody else? Is there options for, you know, cross partnership and different collaborations? You just never know what might be coming next in that way. So I definitely think it's, um, it's valuable to nourish those relationships as much as possible. Um, Cause they really, they really help you, especially as you're, you know, connecting additional trade shows, they might know of additional vendors that you, that can help you with your next product launch. As most companies are using multiple vendors to get something done, um, whether it's from like on the decoration side for components or just the, com um, the component manufacturing to actual filling to then with some companies needing um, other outside resources to fulfill the distribution and warehousing for them. So everyone's so connected in the industry that it's, it's really good to nourish the relationships you do have. And my fifth strategy is really that I wanted to connect on today and just remind people of is really to leverage team brainstorming. I feel it's so easy to think of, oh, you know, what can we do next? And, you know, there's a lot of pressure on management to understand, okay, what exactly should we, where exactly should we innovate or how are we going to solve this problem and from an operational standpoint and get something launched out the door and to really leverage the team you do have. And brainstorming is great for that of having, you know, regular meetings, regular ongoing scheduled meetings where you can obtain frequent feedback from your team on how can you improve in different areas, whether it's a process of how you guys are obtaining innovation and approaching that or also mitigating risk and understanding, okay, as a problem arrives, um, how can we solve this quickly and most efficiently? And being open-minded to new ideas. You know, I find a lot of executives um, at very, you know, higher and larger conglomerates, you're really, a lot of people tend to be stuck in ways that they know and what they're doing. And just being open-minded, especially as companies obtain new talent, um, just leveraging the resource and experiences that people have had throughout their professional careers. It's really important to give um, your team members the space to really share and being able to openly and transparently share with what has worked in the past for them or what they found helpful or what even didn't work at other companies so that you know as you're approaching new innovation and learning how better to, to get your projects launched and out the door, to really be open-minded to what might be presented to you. And to also have that open communication between a team at the, at the um, you know, work level, at the very basis level of the A to Z parts and pieces and your leadership to have recommendations flow both ways. So to kind of, this also kind of, by having all this brainstorming, it really will help to kind of create that open communication that's really needed to ensure that you're having the most effective, um, most effective um, launch experience for everybody all the way around. And open, with the open communication, that kind of sidelines even into, you know, a sixth strategy, even really having that, that ongoing project communication. I find a lot of companies tend to be very siloed. So whether they're larger or smaller is, you know, a lot of departments, whether it's operations or PD or finance or even an executive team, you know, a lot of different teams are holding on to information without really having it openly shared. So, you know, I've, I've found a lot more when, when teams are able to kind of, you know, set their egos aside and set their opinions of each other aside from the respect of, you know, what do I do versus what you do? Um, a lot of magic can happen really when you're able to really lay out, here's all the challenges on the table because you don't know where your next idea is to help fix that problem may come from. And so really, as you're getting on the same page with projects and having ongoing project meetings to really have um, that in place where all the liabilities are listed, or here's all the open concerns I have from an operational standpoint of how we could produce this better, or could we change the design and do this? So having a lot of that open communication as, as new innovation is, um, is being decided upon in initial stages is really key because as as I keep saying and reiterating, is that really looking at your team as a whole and everybody, you know, trying to help to get the product out the door faster, better, more efficiently, um, is really having that open communication. And that's really key as well. So I kind of wanted to review just kind of a, a recap of the different um, 
strategies I mentioned prior is really looking at, you know, establishing a project steering committee if you don't already have that. And ideally that would be, you know, quarterly or at the very least um, biannually as most companies, you know, are planning six, six months to a year at a time and relatively can even be two years out from that. Um, to really consider implementing some type of pro a project PL statement, I'll put a quick sample of one into the resource library for people. Um, but really, the other key thing I forgot to mention here is really looking at the financial aspect of it. Because so a lot of companies, you know, and how it sells on the back end. So you can do an initial PL, but did it really sell how you expected it to sell? Did everything, you know, come in cost wise that way or? Was there any changes? Was there a forecast change later on? So that was different than at the initial approved stage versus what actually happened. So looking at those two comparisons, very important as well. And strategy three, really looking at documenting the type of um, concept request and initial market research that you do. Just so you have it as a reference for later on and having a clear picture of what, you know, what did you work on for this project and what's what's coming next so you have a whole paper trail and just remembering to stay connected to your industry and vendors and to rely on them as a resource as much as they rely on you for continued business is to really develop that relationship into a partnership and how can you help them as much as they can help you um, there's a lot of the other resource um, I will mention I'll add on here is the PBA the professional beauty association I belong to them for, gosh, maybe around four or five years now. And they're great both from a brand side as well as an individual um, that's you know, working in the beauty industry as well. I um, just have a lot of resources, additional things that are on, on their website as well as they do um, a, a monthly newsletter as well. So I found that to be helpful too. And again, just leveraging your team because you don't know who you have on your team unless you really give people you know, the open key to share. So I really have found that to be most helpful even when, you know, walking into different circles and understanding um, where they're at, where their backgrounds are, you know, what they can bring to the table and having those open type of discussions of, you know, how can we improve this or what do you see as an issue for improving innovation at our company? And you never know what some people might bring to the table or an idea of how to switch a process or, you know, a new product idea they might have that you would have never known if you hadn't asked. So I definitely think it's um, key on having these kind of brainstorming feedback sessions as it really allows you to find hidden gems within your company, whether it might be a product idea or you just hired great talent that you not only confirmed on, but you definitely want to retain for the future. So I know today's presentation is a little short today, but I will provide some additional resources um, on here before I upload this to the resource library for everybody to utilize. And I wanted to move on next in case there might be any questions. So I'm going to stop sharing this and switch back to our video. Um, let's see here. So Tracy, I'm not sure if you're on right now at the moment. I am. We don't have any questions that were okay. submitted in advance today. No so problem. They missed out on asking you something really valuable. <laughs> I was Never really, know. I did not know that Sephora exists. That like sounds exactly. fabulous. Like, so, <laughs> I cannot so, wait to attend. <laughs> I think I just want to come with you just for yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. They're doing, um, I'm actually with Sephora when I was up in up at Cosmoprof recently, there were some people up there that had no idea about it either. So it's so this is an important thing for you listeners I, and readers and yeah. watchers out there that, you know, this is the benefit of being in the know. That would have been a great question for Lauren. What trade shows are coming up? You know, yeah. where, where should I be? So yeah, that insight is so valuable. Thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, no problem. And if people want to find that, it's actually on Sephora.com. Um, Sephora made their own website for it. And the tickets, I am trying to confirm more details about it because the website's a little unclear to me of what exactly I get at different ticket offerings. <laughs> so right now their, their price ranges from like 100 to 500. And it's only for like a one day um, 
a one day admittance to their two day event. So you can only go one day with your ticket. So you would have to buy like two ninety nine dollar ones if you want to go both days, I imagine. Um, so I'm trying to get some further information of exactly what that is. I know they just opened, um, I think this last week on the 27th or something for ticket sales, and I don't know how many they have. So I don't know exactly how it's being structured. I do know it's their first event like doing this. So they would, may not totally know yet. <laughs> yeah, I think they're cut. Yeah, I think they're just kind of pre-launching this and seeing how many people kind of initially sign up. So I know that they're going to have some brands represented there. I'm assuming. Oops, hold on. So, so maybe yeah. what we should do is we will have a, we'll have you do a follow up If you send me, if you ping me like, you know, message on Facebook or do something like that, sure. we could do a little follow up. Um, maybe just like a quick little Facebook live. If you've got an update for yeah. anyone, we could just yeah, do that definitely. together. That sounds like a plan. Okay. And then, um, yeah, as I said, I'll mention, I'll add some additional um, resources to the, to the library as well, based on the information I presented in today's Wonderful. session. So Wonderful. Just well, some basic stuff. Well, mm -hmm. thank you so much, Lauren. We really appreciate it. And, appreciate um, and until too. your next episode here on yeah. Product Launch Hazards. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me today, Tracy. I appreciate it.